topic of tonight, uh, what are the steps that are going to take us from climate change to climate action? And I'm focusing on the story of the struggle against the unconventional gas industry, or coal seam gas as people know it better, um, and because I think it's a story which is largely quite positive in a strange sort of way. It, it hasn't, it's not over, it's still a struggle, um, but I think there are some lessons that we can draw on from, from it. By saying it's not over, um, if you don't, you know, you're listening to the Premier and, and, and his energy ministers and all the rest of it, they're basically telling us it is over, it's fine, we've fixed it, don't worry about it. But actually AGL, one of the biggest frackers, continues to frack in Camden and it wants to frack in Gloucester right next to, in, in, in the midst of very, you know, important agricultural land. Uh, Santos is pursuing its, its uh, operations in, Nar in the Narrabri region um, and uh, um, Metgasco is, a, is intent on pursuing its fracking operations in the northern rivers, which you might have heard of the Bentley blockade, um, mass blockade of, of, of the community around uh, in the northern part of New South Wales that even set up a sort of a living camp to stop this company from coming and fracking on their land. That community is virtually 100% against fracking and uh, this gas company's not only decided it wants, it's going to sue the New South Wales government uh, because of a licence that was um, suspended, um, it also is demanding the New South Wales government provides it with the appropriate police force to go in there with its operation. So you can see any way that, that, that the um, campaign needs to continue because the frackers uh, are determined to continue and the struggle has to go on. But it's also true to say that this community-led campaign in New South Wales against the industry has changed the political landscape in New South Wales in a way that not even hardened cynics would once have thought possible. So in 2011, the unconventional gas industry um, wasn't really well established in New South Wales. Uh, it was in Queensland. They thought it could just march down from Queensland um, sell the benefits of jobs, the, the gas rush, the export income, the royalties, and bang, we would have the gas industry in New South Wales. And you'd be getting, you'd be getting cleaner, greener energy as well. This was what they thought they could sell us. Um, they're also going to be, yeah, it hasn't happened, but it hasn't happened largely because of this huge social movement that developed in response. I mean, initially the movement was inspired by this um, US um, filmmaker and activist, Josh Fox. I, th I think many of you would have probably seen the film Gaslands, if not Gaslands 2. Um, but it was also the shocking uh, experience of Queenslanders um, who were experiencing um, the effects of fracking, especially around Tara, which also helped galvanise the New South Wales movement. And so we saw from 2011 to 2015 a phenomenal growth in what I loosely describe as a people-powered movement. Um, and I think that movement um, can also remind us of the power of people working together in an organised fashion. Enormous amount of work went into creating this movement. You know, it's that hard yakka, it's that letterboxing, it's that going creating stalls, information stalls, it's the knocking on doors, it's organising mass rallies, um, human signs as they became known, um, water walks, blockades, pickets, all these things um, help create a, what was called, you know, a, a, a people power movement. And interestingly too, this was not just your environmentalist that you might think is living in a sort of quasi subculture, in the New South Wales North Coast. This was ordinary town folk, this was farmers, this was workers, this was people who have never ever done an ounce of activism in their lives. Um, and as a result, the major parties were forced to sit up and take note. So before this state election in New South Wales, which happened in March, both major parties came out declaring that they were for all about regulating the industry, all about protecting land and water, all about listening to community concerns, um, and the gas industry bosses immediately became alarmed, immediately became alarmed. Now, all the regulations that were put in place as a result of community pressure um, were good, 
although insufficient. But it did show, importantly, that the major parties were feeling the pinch, major parties being the two parties that support the unconventional gas industry. So the New South Wales Coalition set up its Office of Coal Seam Gas uh, and launched a gas plan. And uh, when I went to look at this gas plan, I found to my amazement it was one A4 sheet of paper, the gas plan. This was just before the New South Wales elections. Um, I think it elaborated on it a little bit further down the track, but when it announced the gas plan, it was, it was an A4 sheet of paper. Um, part of that gas plan involved the, a commitment to buy back licences. So this is licences that were sold to companies on, for, as, for as little as, I think it was $50 at the time, um, being bought back for tens of thousands of dollars, even though they had, uh, you know, even if they hadn't been worked. And this was also, oh, well, I won't go down there. So they launched a gas plan which involved buying back licences, so to appease the, 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 the gas companies, um, and, uh, and, and, and imposing stricter regulations about where you could, you could frack. Um, one campaign, the campaign that stopped CSG Sydney, which uh, I'm involved in, um, initiated and got quite a lot of support for was a campaign to cancel the licence. And eventually we did get that licence that covers the whole of the Sydney Basin cancelled as part of this package of cancellations um, uh, before the election. The Labor Party, again a party that was supporting, is supporting the industry, um, changed its policy settings as well and became a lot more critical. Um, and it's now in a position, interestingly, of backing a Greens bill um, in, the, in New South Wales which would basically declare a lot of New South Wales off limits for the gas industry with the exception of a few which they're going to try and sort of um, not revisit or, you know, let run its course and then not renew. So, I mean, this is quite a significant, when you realise um, in the short time it's taken to get to this far, it's quite a significant change of, in policy. Um, by the time of the New South Wales elections as well, the traditional um, um, base of the National Party in the countryside, farmers mainly, but some people in rural settings, National Party had really, had really split and um, the base had split and that's why the Greens won a seat in, in, in rural New South Wales on the back of the campaign. So, okay, now we have a situation in New South Wales where uh, um, I think uh, expiration licences or applications for licences used to cover 60% of the state, now you have gone down to 9%. So that I think is quite important uh, figure. 9%. Um, 9%. But, but in reality, you know, we still have a few major, major projects to, 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 to stop. Um, so in the remaining minutes, I want to turn to the question of how do we help shift the pressure up a gear to force the Turnbull government to take meaningful steps on climate action. And I'm glad that Simon sort of mentioned that we s mentioned the fact that, well, spoke about the fact that we have an enormous, um, you know, the change, of, the change of Prime Minister does not mean a change of policy setting here. Um, in fact, he, I noticed he explicitly said in his uh, first remarks, his first media conference after being elected um, leader of the coalition, of the Liberals, sorry, and therefore Prime Minister, that he would stick to the targets that were um, um, apparently set by Bishop and Hunt, it seems. So the Foreign Minister and the Environment Minister decided on these two, on these targets. Um, and we can take up the precise levels, but they're, they're way too, they're, they're basically targets that climate deniers would, would put up. Um, so the campaign to stop CSG, to stop unconventional gas, I, has been a success I've been trying to underscore because activist oriented groups have managed to cohere a sort of non-partisan united front. What I mean by non-partisan is not that people aren't political, it's just that it doesn't matter what political background or position you hold, you can be involved in this movement if you agree with the movement's demands. So people from a variety of political backgrounds did get involved, many of which would never have imagined working together with each other, um, and they have actually been the backbone of this campaign, largely in rural New South Wales. So farmers, knitting nanas, socialists, Alan Jones supporters have all linked arms, literally and figuratively, <laughs> to form a very formidable force. So I'm calling this a cross-class alliance, if you like. And it was possible because 
everyone who, st who stood to be affected uh, from ruining land and water and forever, and once you pollute underground water supplies, you can't unpollute it, um, saw the reason to come together to fight this industry. And that was, the, that was the important glue that held this sort of city country alliance together and still does. So many stop CSG groups, they're called different things in different places, really got going, um, you know, in the um, 2000 and, or 2010, 2011, and they've done a very good job in continuing the campaign. In the city, Stop CSG Sydney um, formed in response to an attempt to drill in the Sydney Park if you, in St Peter's, so it's five kilometres from the city. No one in their wildest dreams would have thought that would happen, but there you go, they were going to build, build, bring a test drill in just to see you know, where a, um, a scene ended. Apparently one was drilled here at Everly um, in the 1990s or 1980s. So they're obviously sort of checking to see how, <laughs> how big the scene was. So. When we found out about that, that's when Stop CSG Sydney was formed and we stopped that drill from happening and then we got the council to ban it and all the rest of it. So we took off from there. Um, so, but anyway, coming back to the type of alliances that were made, if stop, stopping CSG is a cross-class issue, if you accept that notion, then so too is stopping runaway climate change, in my opinion. However, it is a little bit more complicated <laughs> and we can go into more discussion about this. The various climate action groups um, that formed uh, in across Australia, but um, my experience is more in New South Wales, in the, in the last mass movement that we saw on the streets demanding action on climate change was around about 2009 to 2011. That, in, that comprised longer term and, and newer activists. There was a broad number of people that got involved in those, um, what was called climate action groups. And they were setting up, trying to set up a national network and they were trying to set up a formidable force. Um, long story, but eventually it dissipated and disappeared around the time that the Green Party decided after opposing a carbon tax under Gillard, then went and supported one under Rudd. So at around that time, other way around, sorry, other way around, opposed the Rudd one and it supported the Gillard one. So yeah, around that time, and that, that caused, I think, a lot of confusion in the movement about what are we saying here, where do we go? Um, and, I, and, and confusion about the, the, the Greens about face, this wasn't obviously the only factor, but it was one of the main contributing factors to, you know, what do you do with this climate? How do we go forward with the climate movement? Ironically, I think the Stop CSG movement gained as a result <laughs> of the fact that climate activists were looking for some concrete campaign to get involved in at that time. And so, you know, the, the unconventional gas movements, as they sprung up, and to some extent the anti-coal movements also benefited because they became a, comp a concrete struggle that people could get involved in if they were concerned about, you know, stopping runaway climate change. Okay. All right. So, um... Yeah, so I guess my estimation, um, not, I'm not speaking for Stop CSG Sydney here, but my estimation is that the relative success of the anti-fracking movement in Australia and New South Wales um, has had an invigorating impact on environmental NGOs. And we can talk about what do I mean by environmental NGOs, but, you know, the ones that we know, the 350.org, um, Wilderness Society, Nature Conservation Council, uh, and their probably Wilderness Society, Greenpeace. Um, these have all come together to call for this mass climate mobilisation in, in, in November, late November, as, as Simon's already said. Now, these big marches actually have been taking, part, taking place in Europe and the US and Canada, I think, for some time, for some years. We haven't had one here in a while. So, so actually, I'm quite excited about the fact that this is on the agenda now. Um, um, of course, forcing governments to take real action on climate change isn't as simple as demanding that a fracking company stop. Um, and, but I do think that there are some clear demands that um, those of us that are in the campaigns should be thinking about in light of the, the global climate marches, such as an end to the fossil fuel subsidies <laughs> Simon's just talked about, and the demand to leave coal and coal seam gas in the ground. As, the climate scientists tell us we should be. Um, however, um, 
it seems that some of the organisers, the organisers of the People's Climate March, at least in the Sydney context, are resisting putting these clear demands to the federal government as part of the package of drawing people into the process of, of marching. And I think this is where the power of the, uh, of the anti-fracking movement um, and, and across New South Wales and elsewhere could be harnessed um, into trying to convince these uh, organisers of the march that actually this would be, this is politically important thing to do um, and it's also, um, it's also going to be the thing that does in fact have the unifying potential. Because I think where some of the NGO, uh, environmental NGOs go wrong with their model of organising is that they um, believe wrongly that if you put a demand together, or if you, if you get to put a demand to government, it will alienate people. But in actual fact, I think the reason that the coal seam gas movement has hung together for so long is because precisely because there have been clear demands put on the government and on companies. All right. Um, so I think um, if we're going to make the movement of movements that we need, because the science tells us that we need to do something very, very fast, so if the climate movement is going to grow out of the process of leading up to the climate march in November, uh, we have to try and convince uh, the organisers and others, maybe not organisers, well, maybe we'll never convince them, but maybe other groups, to, to rally around clear, clear demands. Um, because in the end, I guess, people like us, people invested in the process of creating social change, know that it's not good enough to have one big rally and then go home. <laughs> <laughs> and then wait till the next UN conference, have another big rally and then go home. We're in, the, we're in the business of trying to empower ordinary folk to become permanent activists. And as you become a permanent activist, you change your mind about a whole range of things. And you just see the world for what it is and you decide on, 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 on being a part of the, the solution. Um, whereas I think the model that involves people just coming in and then going home, and then coming in and then going home, is a model that precisely allows the status, status quo to get away with what it gets away with. So I think we've got to try and push for clear demands coming out of this mass, um, this, this mass climate march. And, and the ones that I've, I've put, I think, uh, end the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, leave coal, and coal seam gas in the ground, would be a good place to start. Thank you.